Excellent. Hello and welcome back to Insights from the Ecosystem, the second of the day, but uh, no less important discussion than we've ever had. I mean, if I'm honest, when we're looking about rebuilding supply chains, the stakes have never been higher, right, guys? And we thought it was important to uh, to bring together an illustrious panel to, to really uh, answer some of your questions and to, to bring out some of the most important elements of this discussion. So we're lucky enough to be joined by Marco, Katerina and Colin. Um, and of course, we've, we've brought this discussion to you in partnership with C2FO uh, and Colin's here to tell us a little bit about them. Um, I, I do want to encourage you just to reiterate the point from Lorenza. If you do have any questions put for our panel, please put those into uh, the chat. If it's something we think that we're able to, to put to the panel, we'll uh, we'll get a chance to do that as the session goes on. So don't, don't be shy. If you've got a good question, put that in there. Okay, we have a lot to cover, not very much time. So let's press on uh, with the discussion today. Um, Colin, I think it's important to set the scene a little bit as well. Maybe you could tell us a little bit around C2FO and how they help their customers, particularly as we're thinking about bringing them along for this journey that we're about to describe. Thanks, Stephen. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Um, C2FO, I think, I hope, should be well known to most of the audience. Um, we've always been known for running some of the world's most successful supplier finance programs um, with the world's most prestigious companies. And I'm pleased to be joined on stage here on the panel uh, by two of them today. Um, over the last 18 months, we've seen an explosion in the number of our supplier finance programs that are supporting the ESG agenda and therefore topical for, uh, for today's discussion. And I'd say it started with the S in ESG which was typically support for small business, minority or other companies who are somewhat disadvantaged by the financial system. The increasing trend now that we see is to support the E of ESG by financially encouraging suppliers to adopt more sustainable practices, probably the most topical at the moment being carbon reduction. And using this as a positive, um, let me say, a positive incentive for suppliers alongside all of the auditing, compliance and other topics that no doubt we'll talk about today and how you motivate and, um, and get suppliers to, uh, to, to go on the journey with you. So uh, pleased to be sponsoring the, uh, the session today. Pleased to be able to speak. Great. Thank you very much, Colin. And, and you know, so guys, you know, Colin pointed out, you know, an explosion of kind of interest in this area. There's a lot of discussion in the media that, that, that months and years ahead of us are this, this rebuilding phase. And it's always difficult to kind of pass whether how much of that is kind of almost like marketing and how much of that is a genuine intention to rebuild, to do things differently. And I suppose if it is the latter, ESG, sustainability, social uh, responsibility, that's one of the critical pillars of that rebuild. So what I wanted to do, just to kind of set the scene a little bit here, um, maybe we'll start with you, Katerina, and, and you can talk a little bit to, to Danone. Um, you know, tell us a little bit around some of the ambitions in this area and, and how you guys are generally a approaching that shift. Yeah, thanks, uh, Stephen, for, for the introduction. I'm, I'm very happy to be here, here today. For the ones of you who know Danone, a leading uh, food and beverage player, we really believe in the interconnectedness of the health of people and the health of planet. So for us, kind of the ESG commitments have been there for, for a long while, and we don't really think that COVID brought a lot of new topics, but it really uh, focused our attention on the topics we were working on, on, on before. So I think um, uh, COVID was a wake-up call to really understand uh, the, the size and the depth and, and the importance of the uh, climate issues, the biodiversity issues, but uh, perhaps even more importantly also the social issues we have in, in society, because uh, unfortunately uh, also the people who are most the most vulnerable parts of our supply chains were most hardly hit by, by, by the crisis. So, so what Colin was saying about really needing to think about how do we support the smaller players in our value chain uh, is even more important than, than before. So the norm is, is continuing with uh, our environmental uh, commitments, our social commitments, probably really dialing up, uh, trying to go faster. And I think most importantly, really uh, anchoring what we do in our brands so that the brands really pick societal topics that they stand for. And then to all brand activation, all brand content, uh, what the brand stands for really drives this agenda. And uh, secondly, also really doing it more collaboratively and I guess we get to, to talk more about that as, as our conversation goes on. So I uh, hand over to, to Marco from here. Absolutely. And lots to, lots to unpick there that I do want to get to as well, Katerina. Some really good points. There. Uh, Marco, uh, the same sort of thing from you. It'd be really good to hear that perspective. Uh, Philips have got some, some big ambitions when it comes to ESG, right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Katerina. Uh, great explanation. I can perfectly build on that. So thank you for that. 
Uh, well, yeah, we've been around for quite some time in this, in this arena. I think we started in 72 with our first uh, baby steps in sustainability. And by now, we try to make some big leaps, uh, which is not easy. Uh, because if you're you try to make big steps, then uh, you have to be built very bold. So we, we built it on three pillars in the past. Uh, and those were, especially in R&D, that we came with uh, sustainable solutions. Uh, it was in our sites with sustainable plants. And of course, we had to multiply the impact in our supply chain. And if you know that 15,000 suppliers we have in bill of material, and we have a handful of sites, which is 40, you know exactly where the dirt is hidden. Yeah? It's in the supply chain. That's where it is. So you better focus on that and you better start also building good, good partnerships over there. I will come back to that later. So those three pillars now we have changed in, in that we have helped the company in the transitioning to, we call it a purpose-driven company where we aim to improve uh, 2 billion uh, lives by 2025. And we've got a lot of programs lined up for that. I will not go in a lot of details, but it is access to care. It is about refurbishment and, and we have got a complete site for that. Uh, but also our suppliers. We said we want to improve lives in our supply chain. Uh, and we're talking about more than a million people over, uh, also in there. So that is quite a big ambition uh, and quite a big step uh, compared to how we used to do it, let's call it in the early 70s. Absolutely. I mean, a, a big step. And, and I think to, 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 to something Katarina said, a lot of these ambitions were in place before, but perhaps there's been an interest in, in dialing things up and moving more quickly. And it, it, it'll be interesting to unpick some of the things that you guys are doing to, to try and make that happen. And, and, and Colin, I want to hear a little bit because I'm going to turn to you as to, to provide the broader perspective, because obviously this isn't just a European conversation. We have two uh, European based organizations here, but this is this is broader than that. There is, you know, it's happening across the world in North America. This is quite a sophisticated conversation as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit around how you're seeing that shift play out? In, in, in the businesses that you work with and in the supply chains? Yeah, for sure. And um, we are, I'd say we're somewhat privileged uh, because of the, the global nature of our business and the scale of our business that we now see uh, lots of interesting data, which in turn has been useful for our customers predicting, um, you know, some of the things that have been occurring. Um, so one of the trends or patterns that I would call out would be um, we saw very early days, that trend of uh, moving, I think Katarina talked about this, moving from um, the supply chain focus of cost and efficiency to resilience, or I think the phrase that's being used often today, and I think it was used in the Snyder presentation earlier on, was moving from, uh, from just in time to just in case. So that real balance between uh, sourcing local, sourcing regionally, sourcing um, globally. I think the other trend that we're seeing is the, and again, Katrina touched on this, so did Marco, the focus on um, small businesses who often bring innovation and are seen as the economic growth engine for, uh, for many customers. What that means in both cases, the volume of suppliers that procurement teams now have to manage has been increasing. And I'm going to say that's been good for C2FO and for some of our finance programs where we've always had that reputation for supporting the whole supply chain, not just a small number of large suppliers, which was good back in the day, but making it now easy for procurement teams to support the whole the whole supply chain and supply development and supply resilience. Absolutely, and uh, so let's let's get into the, to, to some of the mechanics of how that's going to happen. So, I mean, Catherine, I'm going to come to you first to think a little bit around the approach Danone have taken, have been taking. And I really want to think about what the, the supply chain of years to come is going to look like. We talked about who we're going to work with. That's already kind of come up. We've talked about the ambitions to, to positively impact the lives of our suppliers that, that, you know, this is something that Philips have in scope. You know, these, these are big ambitions. What are some of the real shifts you think that maybe are going to take place when it comes to how we approach who is in our supply chain and how we work with them? So thanks, Stephen. You you actually covered them quite quite well there. So, so you have partly paraphrasing what you were saying. So I really see three shifts. I think we will see more local uh, supply chains. I think we will see more collaborative uh, supply chains and approaches, and we will see more inclusive supply chains. And I've just opened up the the tree very quickly. So I, um, you know I think uh, through through the COVID crisis. 
people really understood uh, and reconnected with food, understanding where is food coming from, how is food produced. And you understood that through the purchasing decisions you make, you actually can help the farmer around the corner. And uh, so that that uh, food security and contributing to the society where you live became all of a sudden uh, top of top of mind for for people. I do think we have to be careful. It's it's not like everything is going to be local. We have to make sure that what we do local is also sustainable. Sometimes it can be so subscale that it's actually not a sustainable solution and actually introduces unnecessary risk. So I would say it's kind of a smart localization, uh, but but a very and smart and very thoughtful one. The collaboration, I think, will come from just the complexity of the issues we're talking about. Are they environmental, social? They're just so big that I don't bigger than any of our companies. So if we don't work collaboratively, uh, private, public sector, uh, between companies, share our learnings, do things jointly, I don't think we will get there on on, on time. And uh, and then when uh, on the inclusive one, it's really I think as companies we really need to think about how are we uh, contributing to driving communities where we operate. So then, how do we allow people in those communities to be part of our supply chain, uh, take part uh, in in our our growth? How do we create job opportunities? How do we financially empower these people to be independent players in our value chains, but then still uh, kind of uh, have the market access through to what, what we do as, as bigger companies. So I really see those three shifts are uh, going to set the tone for, for the, the years to come. And it is interesting to feel that it's becoming more part of the public discussion, as you said, around particularly around food. Um, speaking here from a country that has has uh, decided that localization is easy to do if you just separate yourselves from Europe and perhaps is finding out that might not necessarily be the case. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely the part, learning that, that how that works and what the implications are there, it's, it, it's starting to happen more broadly. And I think that's very interesting to see how that plays out. But I suppose the point that I want to make first is that it, it's, it's not simple. A lot of procurement organisations in the past have often approached things with saying, well, we can have a scorecard, we can do some tick box exercises, and that will probably allow us to, to make some simple decisions. But how you want to work with suppliers to, to promote these kinds of values and how you want to select the suppliers you work with, that's, that's a challenge, right? That's a key initiative, and it isn't just tick box checking. Marco, can you tell us a little bit more about how you guys are thinking about driving change in terms of getting the ESG values you want to see reflected in your supply chain? Well, Maybe I make this extremely simple because we've got four bullet points. Uh, bullet point number one is we're going to work on things that we need to do. So that is the must-dos. Uh, one of the must-dos has to do with, so let's go everything in the compliance environment. Uh, so that is mainly products, materials. So that is everything that has to do with rush reach, what have you. For that, we have got a completely automated system. We can see everything that is, we are tracking at almost real time. And, and that is something that you cannot look away from. And that's easier to be done in electronics environment uh, than I think in food industry, because of course we can measure things more easy, and that is KPI driven. If you then look to uh, the second program that we're running, that is beyond auditing, and that is very cool and very exciting. And I want to maybe explain uh, later on was a little bit more about that, uh, and that completely ties into the question that you said. Uh, how do you do that? You do that by embracing your suppliers and throw your stick away. And that is a completely different approach with completely different outcomes and a completely different way of working than most of the people, uh, most of the companies are doing. I think we are one of the very few that dare to leapfrog in this, uh, this area. And it's unbelievable cool what is happening over there. And I can write a book about it. Uh, so if you would give me another half an hour later, I can fill that easily with that time. Yeah? Certainly pre-order the book. Um... And we'll, uh, I do want to t press you a little bit more on the beyond auditing in a moment. And so we're mm -hmm. definitely going to come back to that because I think that's, that's a really cool initiative. Um, I, I also want to make sure that we're not losing sight. Something that you mentioned earlier, Katerina, of that, that social element and uh, perhaps an increasing feeling that um, organisations and, and procurement organisations uh, need to know more about the social impact of their supply chain. Certainly, investors are more interested and it feels like we're moving away from it being just avoiding headlines to bringing about the change we want to see. Um, again, just to, just to kind of think about what's different. This isn't just a tick box exercise, right? We're, we, we're moving away from that. And how has that played out? Have you seen that development? So I think it's really for our procurement teams, we really need to understand our value chain, where value is generated and how that value is, is distributed. 
And uh, I for sure, if I take a look at our supply chains, we do have an uh, unfair uh, situation. So not everybody in our supply chain is today making a decent living. And that cannot be a sustainable position to be in. And we really need to work hard to, to make sure that everybody that we are dependent on uh, has the chance for that sustainable, uh, uh, decent, decent living. And our approach has been very much to, to work very closely, and, and particularly on the agricultural side, it's with, with the farmers. We have 58,000 farmers that we have a direct uh, relationship with. 80% of them are smallholders. And then in helping them to, to create value, uh, we work, it's, it's very complex projects. Uh, they have to be long-term. Uh, you have to commit. I uh, could take an example, for example, from Mexico, where we have for 10 years now worked with local farmers, small dairy farmers, uh, allowing them, uh, connecting them to Danone, uh, but really focused on uh, allowing them to develop their own small businesses so that they can uh, they can uh, deliver a higher quality product to us uh, whilst uh, making more money themselves. It's actually amazing that you get to one to the 30. So we invest one dollar and then you can create 30 dollars uh, of value in, in the supply chain. Uh, you can increase uh, farmer income by uh, two to three uh, times uh, without actually impacting our cogs negatively. On the contrary, also impacting our cogs positively. But these are not things you do overnight. Uh, they are complex, and I said, therefore, this, this long-term commitment, we really have, if we are serious about this, we then have to get our head around how can we commit and what can we commit to to drive this, this change. I think that's, that's probably really the, the commitment part is, is the most important one. I think that commitment piece is so interesting as well. And, and Colin, I want to bring you in here, because if, you, if you're going to commit to these things, you, you know, as an organisation, you need to figure out how you're going to support working with the right suppliers. And particularly at a time when um, for many industries, you know, there's, it, it's economically challenging. You know, the, the procurement needs to have a strategy here to be able to work with the right businesses and, and to bring them with them on that journey. But, you know, Colin, I mean, you know, this is something that, that the C2FO, obviously, you guys play a role in. Can you talk us through how you approach that? Uh, yeah, for sure. Before I do that, can I just applaud? I loved hearing um, Marco and Katerina talking about what, what they're doing, because everything that they talked about was um, about collaboration, about working with, supporting and reaping the benefits then of the um, of what they've done in terms of reduced cost of goods or, uh, or, or increasing revenue streams. So the positive side of working with suppliers and how that how, how that comes through. And Mark, I'm going to um, plagiarise your use of throw the stick away. That's going to be on there front and centre on some of my presentations and part of what we we encourage. So Katerina used the term um, collaborative. Maybe not many people know that C2FO, the C2 is two Cs, collaborative cash flow. So it's how do we help our um, support the supply chain through the use of what I often call inclusive um, finance. Because one of the uh, one of the things is whatever you're doing, cash always was and always will be the lifeblood of any organization. So corporates have really appreciated our ability as they're moving through these uh, initiatives, whether it's um, about innovation, whether it's about ESG, to financially support every single supplier in the ecosystem. And whether that's been supporting them through difficult times during the pandemic, whether that's been funding increased production volumes, or indeed restarting the business, all of which needs working capital. Um, so um, in our ESG, ESG agenda, we talk a lot about financial inclusion. And financial inclusion means allowing suppliers access to the working capital they need to fund the changes to do all the things that we've just heard about. Absolutely. And again, this comes back to this idea of, you know, the, the commitment required uh, and and possibly, you know, not 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 using procurement in as it used to be done, right? Where some of the old practices that a lot of organisations would have used just are going to get in the way rather than drive things forward here. Uh, Marco, I want to come to you. I promised we would come back to that beyond order thing because I'm personally very interested in it. Uh, I imagine our audience are too. And again, you know, this is this idea that um, we, we need to perhaps focus on relationships with suppliers if we're truly trying to drive real change. And that's not to say auditing doesn't have its place necessarily, but I'm really interested in how you guys think about uh, you know, what it, what beyond auditing is and how you can move beyond it in order to, to build those more collaborative relationships. How do you guys approach that? What does it, what does it involve? Courage. It needs a lot of courage. So you have to throw away your old habits. Uh, I met a lot of suppliers in the past before we changed it. 
And we saw that there was suffering under the auditing system. And I also saw the outcome of uh, all the auditing audits that have been done. And there was a lot of audit fatigue and even an industry to uh, gear up the supplier to be ready for that audit. Uh, but nothing changed in their DNA, nothing changed in their approach, nothing changed after the auditor has left the building. We saw that year over year, and we did an, we did an audit three years later, we came back, we found the same, same uh, let's call it the same issues, back all over and all over again. I said, this has to stop, this gets a little bit silly, so can we find something else? So it was because I'm also uh, very active in lean and, and continuous improvement. I said, why don't we throw, try to throw these things into the equation? Let's see how we can collaborate with other suppliers. And what we did is we tried first to measure um, sustainability and sustainability performance against all the pillars that you can imagine. And at this moment in time, we can. Yeah? We've got now a tool and a, and a methodology which uh, on how we can more or less rate every company against a very standardized way of uh, looking at sustainability it entails everything. So uh, you cannot imagine what is all in there. It has 700 questions, that's so quite a lot. You can say it's too much. Uh, we can have a, a lengthy discussion about yes or no, but let's say it's enough, yeah? The amazing, the, the amazing results that we achieve at this moment in time uh, are number one, we find things that we didn't dare or didn't dare to dream of. First of all, we didn't think we had zero tolerances in our supply chain. One of the things that you uh, get when you get an audit, you get an audit report, the supplier gets an audit report, but of course they don't want to look bad uh, and they don't want to give you a report uh, that is coming from a supplier and they don't want to, want to look to the supplier look bad in front of his customer. So they will find something, but not a real in-depth uh, DNA uh, exposure from that supplier. If we are going there, we are telling the supplier there's no, really no, no, no punishment they have. Please be open. We are here to help. Please step alongside and we will be okay. 93% of suppliers do so. And what is super cool is that we find, and I, I could ask you a question, but let me fill it in for you. We find a lot of GT zero tolerances in the first year that we collaborate with that supplier. It's an amazing number, it's 45%. So almost, almost half of our suppliers had something hidden which we never knew before. Uh, for example, uh, we find child labor, we find uh, severe pollution to environment, we find uh, fraud, we find all kinds of stuff. They just need help. And then we help them to overcome those issues uh, in a very structured manner. And then suppliers, I don't say they send love letters, but it's close to that. What they send to us is, thank you very much. And one of the suppliers gave a quote, and I give this to you, Colin, because you like quotes. They told us, literally this guy told me, and I, I, I'm, I've written it down because I did not want to forget, Marco, finally, finally, we do not need sustainability policing. We need sustainability doctors, and that's exactly what you do. So thank you for your help. Thank you for coming alongside and helping us to improve. One last sentence and then I stop. The improvements are staggering. It's just amazing. The first year, first year when they're in our program, their improvement on the ESGs or whatever you call them in, on the ESG scale is around 40%. The second year is still around 20%. So you see them growing. And the only thing that we want is to see growth. I'm not interested in the absolute value. I'm only interested in how they grow over time. And for that, we uh, give also rewards. It's amazing. It's just super cool. So happy with this. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, thanks for being so quotable there, Marco. Always, always appreciated. Um, I, I think uh, I, I do want to dig into one point there. And Catherine, I want to bring you back in on this one. Uh, you know, I feel like you know, we were alluding to a technical challenge here. And, and this is the challenge of understanding the data behind supply chain and, and sustainability performance. You know, Marco was referring to, you know, what sounded to me like a relatively sophisticated system to capture and understand that side of sustainability performance. But the data goes a lot deeper than that. If we're saying we want to go into, you know, we want to have local inclusive supply chains, we need to have sight of their practices. So can you give us a little bit around how you guys are thinking about procurement's capability to assess uh, and understand its supply chain? Me? You want to say? Um, I'm sorry. I'm going. I'm going for Katharina on this one. Okay. Okay. So, so um, uh, you know, um, 
As we said, like even in situ FO, it is at the end of the day, it's a technology solution where we bring our visibility or where that financing need is. But also when we talk about this, not just on time, but just in case uh, approaches, it's really about visibility. And I think uh, every CPO, every supply chain person in the world uh, was grateful for any data and analytics initiatives you had on the go when uh, the COVID crisis hit, because now all of a sudden your supply chains were disrupted everywhere simultaneously. And the more visibility you had, uh, uh, the better off you were. And I'm also really impressed with the teams in where we were lacking that visibility, how quickly it could be put in place. And so I think we all really need to remind ourselves, don't think that technology or even your data structures is going to be an issue. There's just so fantastic tools out there, and you can go at enormous speed to then really start to pick up small changes. Like in our case, we started to monitor uh, PO approvals. If a PO, and if a supplier normally approves a PO in hours and it took them a day, that was for us, okay, start to work on plan B, just in case. They are a little bit too slow in approving POs, there's probably an issue. Three days later, when there was an issue, plan B was already in place. And so that's kind of one of, of really creating that visibility. But then again, I think we need to really open up and have a discussion with our uh, data and IT uh, departments in terms of how do we allow these uh, systems to connect, because we really need to pull the data together all, all in one place. And we won't have time to talk about it today, but you know, I think what's really then interesting is when we help also the smaller players in our supply chains to get access to data and improve their performance, be it um, the E or the, the S part uh, of, of the ESG uh, commitments, uh, data-driven decision-making is going to be absolutely key to, to improving uh, performance. So, so lots to come there. And I think any procurement organization that is not yet investing in data and analytics uh, I would get onto that agenda very quickly. Colin, data-led decision-making. I, I, I would be surprised if you didn't have something to say on this one. I mean, we, we've, we've said some of the tools need to be digital-led. They need to be practice-led. If we're talking about rebuilding supply chains, you, you, you need to be bringing this all together. Um, so can you give us an idea of how you see businesses, need, people who are listening today, equipping themselves to, to support some of the changes we're talking about? Yeah, I, I, as a technology vendor, I um, I... I couldn't agree more around the um, the data driven decision making point, and um, almost as a byproduct of um, of implementing CTFO, um, our customers have got quite a lot of data and visibility, and of course their suppliers have got quite a lot of data and visibility on you know on on the invoice status, which is important to them. I'm, I'm going to go back though to the theme of um, collaboration and supporting businesses here because I think it's so important. Obviously, we do that um, digitally through our supply chain finance programs. Um, but that whole theme of, um, of support for suppliers, I think, is important or collaboration, whatever you want to call it. Many times I hear organizations rightly asking their customers, uh, sorry, rightly asking their suppliers to adopt, um, say, environmental standards to support the co corporate buyer with their own goals. Um, I think yesterday, for example, I saw... Mercedes-Benz announced that it has asked all its suppliers to join us in pursuing our goal of uh, carbon neutral by 2039, and that it only wishes to work with suppliers who share its sustainability goals in the future. It's a great statement and, and a lofty goal from Mercedes. The smart organizations, and we heard today from, from Philips and Danone how they support that transition, but many simply demand change without understanding what it truly means to a supplier. And if you as a corporate buyer are asking for, um, for change within your supply chain, it's likely that most of our other customers are. So you need to be collaborative in, um, and supportive in that journey with your suppliers and you will get much back in return. And if we think about the EN, ESG agenda, maybe think of a, you know, my closing statement would be something like the, the discussion with the supplier would be support me in my drive for let's say carbon reduction, and in return, based on your progress, I can give you increasingly better access to cheaper working capital to support and fund your, your, your business. That's a real incentive, and it's really what we're doing now to support this move. So. Absolutely, and I think the one thing I'm going to take away from this is that there's a, a, a we have to be bold. If you're listening, you've heard that Marco, Katerina, and Colin are all supporting more, more bolder ways to go after 
um, some of the ambitions that organizations have. If your organization has that ambition, it's no good doing what you've been doing before. It's time to look at things you can do differently and maybe reinvent uh, something that's been been broken before. Who knows? Um, thank you very much to all our panelists. I would say if you if you have any questions that were un unanswered, apologies to those. We'll make those available to the panelists um, post event. Also, if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about C2FO, uh, I believe we posted a, a link in the chat there where you can pick up a further conversation uh, with our colleagues at C2FO, who will be able to talk you through a little bit more about what they do, how they support you. But I, I just want to say, you know, fantastic conversation. As you can imagine, any one of our panelists could have could have talked for several more hours if we'd uh, if we'd given them the space and uh, it's been wonderful to hear from them so i just want to say a big thank you to marco katarina and colin thank you very much guys uh, it's been wonderful having you, you here thank you for joining the conversation and i shall hand back to you lorenzo